just uh, briefly introduce the series and more importantly, the Brian uh, Musa, Professor Musa, to you. I don't think he, for most of you, it doesn't need the introduction. So um, for the last uh, uh, couple of months on a monthly basis, we've been uh, doing a series of lectures on uh, ethics and Islamic intellectual traditions. Um, partly this was inspired you know, by a, uh, a long period of thinking about how to think about uh, moral and ethical uh, positions and uh, frameworks in Muslim societies, contemporary Muslim societies. And we felt that uh, much of the literature did not uh, pay sufficient attention, at least now. I think earlier there used to be some attention to what is called morality, but not sufficiently to these ethical frameworks, the ethical traditions in the past. So we've uh, been really glad to have uh, Professor Ibrahim Musa to join our uh, 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 to, to present his uh, latest reflections on a topic that he has been thinking about for a long time. As you know, or you might not know that Professor Ibrahim Musa he is a uh, well-known scholar of uh, uh, Islamic ethics and Islamic law at the moment. He is the Mirza family professor of Islamic thought and Muslim societies at the, at the University of Notre Dame. And uh, he has been working, his interests span both classical and modern Islamic thought with a special focus on Islamic law, history, ethics, and theology. I think this, what really attracted me to this paper that has been pre-circulated is uh, the kind of uh, reflections on, you know, thinking about brain death and also that turns to how we think about modern science and how that has impacted on uh, Muslim thinking or Islamic thought as such. As we know, in the past, there was an uns uh, almost some, you know, there was sometimes tension between what was science and what was Islamic law or Islamic theology. But uh, there was a spectrum of people thinking about, uh, you know, uh, science and, and, and particularly ethics. Uh, and, but uh, with the development of, or at least with the introduction of modern science, from the 19th century, people like Sayyid Ahmed Khan, we're actually arguing that perhaps we need to have a different kind of uh, theology, a new Elmi Kalam Jadid. I think the last year has uh, seen a lot of scholars contributing to that discussion. I think that I would consider Ibrahim Musa as one of the former scholars addressing that issue. Is addressing the particular uh, question today, and I'm not going to read the uh, great abstract that he sent to you because I hope that you have seen that. But said and also read the paper. So considering being and know and knowing in an age of techno techno science. So directly confronting the implications of science, the implications of the technology of science, technologization of science, and what, how that impacts on thinking about culture, how that impacts on thinking about religion or Islam in religion in general, but Islam in particular. So I'll ask, uh, invite uh, Ibrahim, Professor, Professor Musa to address us on the paper for about uh, 30 minutes or so, uh, up to you. And then we'll have uh, sufficient time for some comments and discussion. Uh, thank you all. Thank you, Ibrahim. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Tayyab. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Um, it's really a, a, a great honor and privilege to, to be part of uh, this conversation that you have inaugurated at, at University of Cape Town, Professor Tayyip. And my, my first place of academic work, uh, Professor Tayyip, he, he's too modest to say that he was my dissertation advisor um, uh, some time ago. <clears throat> and um, uh, one of the uh, people who's uh, whose opinions are highly value in, in matters of Islamic studies scholarship and a whole range of other uh, areas, especially his friendship uh, to me over the decades. And so this is a really great opportunity for us to talk. I'm also aware that there's a whole range of participants here uh, from Professor Maryam al to Professor Obey Bakr to Professor Khalid Masood, who can say and speak much more authoritatively about these issues. So I will be extremely uh, uh, you know preliminary and 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 there are many of you are scientists and and medical people on this call so I'm kind of intimidated about the kind of things that I'm going to say <clears throat> but uh, nevertheless um, I, I can only learn by making some mistakes uh, 
So, um, so l let me put it in, in this way, you know, for, for a long time, discussions about Muslim bioethics and, and this volume that I contributed to medicine and Sharia um, is a kind of a combination of my frustration in the way in Muslim bioethics have been done. In other words, uh, you know, someone has a question about, you know, uh, can we do transplantation? Can you do, you know, what kind of medicines can you use? Can we do genetic engineering? Uh, then a question is sent to many uh, fatwa councils. There are some international ones or local ones. And they then respond um, in different ways. So the more international ones bring experts, uh, you know, science experts to the table, medical experts to the table, and uh, they then deliberate, and then the fatwa, the answer is A or nay, yes or no. Um, or, and, and I've been kind of uh, frustrated or dissatisfied with that level of, of, of dealing with very complex questions because this yes, no answer does not go into the details of how do you understand technology? How do you understand the body? The fatwa doesn't fully reveal that. You have to spend a lot of time trying to guess what the fatwa is trying to say about the body. Guess what the fatwa is trying to say about the soul. Or is the conversation about the body, about the soul, is it in some ways consistent or, or is there a break with the Islamic historical tradition? Um, so... I've published some work on the question of technology uh, in Islamic thought. Uh, it's a paper that I published some time ago. You can find it on my uh, website, ibrahimmusa.com under publications. Uh, but this is the first time that I began to look at kind of theological texts of the past. And also, uh, Professor, Professor Tari would be glad to hear this, that, you know, after my journey with Ghazali, uh, uh, and I can still journey with Ghazali, but I'm also interested in the people that Ghazali critiqued, the philosophers, the mus Muslim philosophers like Ibn Sina, Al-Farabi, and others. And lo and behold, as I delve into early Muslim theology, well, you know, say uh, Muslim theology in the 10th, 11th century, and so on, and then later, uh, 14th century onwards, you find all these people, even after Ghazali, uh, especially, uh, you know, Georgiani and uh, Avaduddin al-Iji, very, very important uh, Ashari theologians, this, their premise on starting off and talking about the soul, talking about the body, talking about health, they start off with Ibn Sina, what Ibn Sina said. So despite the fact that, you know, Ghazali severely criticized Ibn Sina for stepping out of the line, stepping out of the Muslim consensus on three issues, Muslims historically valued Ibn Sina. Then if you read people like uh, Mullah Sadra, and Mullah Sadra kind of, as some people claim that he's a phenomenologist of religion, thinks about that existence is constantly, and I have a long quote uh, from of Mullah Sadra on page 102, um, and talking about how his ontology is, and he talks about that being is constantly mutating, the, uh, you know, sayalan uh, al-wujud, uh, the fluidity, of, of, of being and change and those kind of issues, I realized that, you know, um, uh, those of us who had gone into Muslim ethics without reading uh, the Muslim classics have gone into this conversation with our hands tied to our backs, that we have a lot of resources in the tradition to also help us navigate that, especially in the light of the vast and the large uh, and the high levels of skepticism amongst the traditional ulama about modern philosophy and all kinds of modern knowledge with the anthropology, sociology, uh, and, and, and modern philosophy, the deep level of skepticism because it's produced in the West, they feel it is kind of untouchable and, and sorry for using a Jewish idiom here, is not kosher, uh, in that it's not halal because of the civilizational conflict of colonization and suspicion from things that come to the West, especially amongst traditional ulama when it comes to the classic body of knowledge. Yet Muslim practitioners with these doctors and lawyers and engineers and so on, continuously to draw on uh, the products of the West, the knowledge products of the West, in especially the empirical sciences, uh, uh, because they think that that is accessible 
and that is kind of objective and verifiable and carries no cultural baggage and carries no civilizational baggage. Big mistake, of course. Uh, science carries with it a culture. Uh, science is not beyond culture and the culture debate for Muslims is also often uh, very, very uh, frustrating and, and, and oftentimes the debate is incoherent because of political and other kinds of tensions. <clears throat> so that is by way of, of, of saying that uh, what I tried, to, uh, you know, where this uh, paper comes from and how I'm trying to think about this. So the issue at hand is the question of, say, um, defining death. So the historical position is uh, that Muslim fuqaha, Muslim theologians, Muslim jurists, whenever they determine death, was determined on the basis of what we call cardiopulmonary indicators, right? Heartbeat, pulse, and those kinds of things. Great. <clears throat> now, are these indicators, are these, are these, are these supplied by revelation or by prophetic authority? Answer is no. These are provided by way in which human beings in the cumulative experience understood what is death. Right? This, there's, no, there's, no, there's no secret about that. Uh, how death was determined at, a, at, at particular times in history. In our time, something else intervenes in what I call technoscience. In other words, in, in, in the previous uh, time, uh, uh, instances in history, science was the driver of thinking and also philosophical thinking that overlapped there, science in itself. But science then was not empirical. I mean, now someone might remind me that someone like uh, Al-Biruni was extremely empirical. Uh, or uh, Abu Bakr al-Razi was extremely empirical. Uh, uh, yes, but generally, <clears throat> if you think about Western science, you know, science was oftentimes reflective and, 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 and in some levels abstract, based on certain kind of philosophical propositions, metaphysical propositions uh, that associated with that. <clears throat> with the rise of technology, this process has been reversed in which techno and in the in, in the past, <clears throat> excuse me, the technologist was always seen as the less prestigious uh, profession. Because the technologist is the person who put things together. The more the, the the person who had craft. But the scientist was, you know, the the main person. What has happened is that in the modern period, technology surpasses the scientific thinking and becomes a driver that enhances the power of, of scientific discovery by you know, giant you know, uh, telescopes that are now being put up into the sky. We can see beyond uh, what we could see before. We can see inside the body MRIs. We can see now you know, the quality and the nature of, of blood and muscles and so on with, with deeply invasive technologies made possible by technological, a technological revolution from the steam engine to MRI and beyond. <clears throat> so that has reversed the process. And the other thing is also uh, technology and capitalism was a big thing that technology was harnessed by capitalism and capitalist in, in invention uh, to make it now accessible that we have <clears throat> in our hands. I can't find my cell phone. But the cell phone, once upon a time, this cell phone was a giant, uh, uh, you know, a big room size machine that could possibly do half the things that this thing does today. I remember when I was a journalist working at the Cape Times, uh, the computers were ho hosted in massive rooms and <laughs> it was basically just doing uh, typewriting, you know, uh, facilities and so on. Uh, now it has all changed. So this question of this revolution, the technological revolution. The other, the other uh, issue is also, is that the that the our view of science, and I particularly refer to, uh, you know, two uh, um, important uh, uh, science uh, thinkers, um, Ilya uh, Prigogini and Prigogine and Isabella Stengers, 
Um, Prigogine is Russian who ended up in Belgium and Stenger is also in Belgium. And they think about the question of that we have moved in our thinking of science, which includes the human body, human biology, but also, also physics and so on, from a, uh, a, a, a way, an order where we thought about stability, order, uniformity, and equilibrium. And that was kind of a closed system uh, with linear relationships between uh, in physics and science more broadly. And the Prigozhinian, the Prigozhinian paradigm makes us shift our attention to an age in an age of acceleration where disorder, instability, diversity, disequilibrium, non-linear relationships uh, in which small inputs can trigger massive consequences uh, and temporality, the question of time related to uh, you know how we think about the flows of time where there's linear or cyclical or both at the same time uh, in, in, dif in different modalities where these are important features. And, and so the order of being, what we call the onto ontological shift, the order of being, the, the order itself, uh, being itself <clears throat> is now being driven by an open and an accelerated cosmological order. Uh, what does that mean? <clears throat> In other words, that, <clears throat> excuse me, some of you might realize it's still early morning and you, um, uh, besides uh, a few exchanges with my wife, I haven't really used my voice this morning. So, um, no, I did use it, but I guess uh, this time <clears throat> uh, there's, a, there's a few things, uh, times I'm going to clear my, clear my voice. But uh, 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 coming back to, not to be distracted, um, coming back to this question of um, an, an open order that we think of our cosmos as continuously expanding. <clears throat> now, this also affects at the high philosophical level our understanding of what we know, of knowing. Because knowing also is no longer stable as we used to be, but is also highly contingent. Um, so these are the kind of issues that, that, that philosophically, you know, both worry me, but also excite me. Uh, they are both troubling, but also challenges, uh, because, you know, at least uh, someone like myself who tried to hold on to both a traditional uh, a viewpoint, what I call critical traditionalism, as well as dealing with the realities uh, of our time and, and not wanting to be anachronistic uh, uh, in terms of what we know and how we know, uh, these are the issues that are, 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 are fairly critical. So I, I, I shared with you the question of how technology and techno science has now ordered the nature of being the way we imagine it. But whether you want to disagree with me or not, our bodies are already shaped and formed by these open-ended forms of being. From the way we communicate now, uh, from the way we ingest medications, the, the smart vaccine that some of us have, 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 have in our body, the MR, mRNA uh, uh, you know, uh, vaccine, uh, these are very smart things that now move to different parts of the body uh, in very interesting ways. It's, it's a different you know, uh, technology uh, 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 that now goes right to the, uh, deals, uh, creates antibodies. We did create antibodies in the virus before, but this is a more sophisticated way of targeting uh, antibodies when the bad virus comes into our body and, and, and simulates it and then, then destroys it. So that is the technology. Um, so when we come to the question of brain death, the question then arises, okay, so brain death. Is brain death death? Many traditional Muslim scholars uh, object to declaring a death because the ventilator and the respiratory systems that they link to a body that has now, that suffers irreversible brain death, a body that suffers irreversible brain death, to the best of our knowledge, and that is almost 99% accurate. There are sometimes exceptions when a diagnosis is, is, can, be, can be erroneous. When you have that irreversible brain damage, um, some traditional scholars still think because they see pulsation, which is being simulated by, by a machine, by technology. 
So there, there is some pulsation, there is breathing and so on and so forth, but this is all mechanistically driven. They think there's life. Whereas another measurement, the measurement of consciousness, the deeper uh, examination of the brain and those parts of the brain that, that clearly that we know to the best of our knowledge that th this cannot be repaired, will not repair itself or neither do we have at the present, do we have the facility to, to, to uh, materially repair it. Death has already set in and, um, and the deterioration of the body already takes place despite the fact that you keep it on, on, on ventilators and machinery and, and pulsation. And even if you put in some fluids in it, that is basically kept there so that they can harvest organs if the person is a donor or if the family wants to donate organs, those organs can be kept fresh for some time, not permanently. And even after such time, you know, that body will start deteriorating because brain function, you know, disappears. Now, the question is from a, a perspective of Islamic philosophy and theology, I don't think it is good enough to say uh, that there is life because it is simulated breathing. Nor can you say there is death. Um, um, I do believe it is, it is death, but what I'm saying is that if you are going to be on the side of life or you're on the side of death, you need to give an account. You need to give a, a story. You need to give a, a justification why you say it is death. Why do I say it is death? Um, and that this question of death is, is based on a careful account uh, of, um, of a complex epistemology, um, that uh, knowledge that would verify for me that death is set in. And I accept that knowledge. And that knowledge is now uh, with reasonable certainty in my, in, my, in my heart and mind. And then I declare that the person is, is, is dead uh, on the basis. And I do believe that uh, philosophical reflection, uh, philosophical and theological reflection um, uh, is, is, is crucial to that. And I've gone through um, you know, the, the, um, some of the authors, uh, people like Ghazali, despite the fact that people say Ghazali is, is anti-philosophy, anti-reason, and so on and so forth, he says that we need to start from, in all theological uh, uh, meditations and reflections, you must start from first philosophy. First philosophy is straight out of Aristotle, al falsafat al-Ula, right? These are your metaphysical or philosophical uh, 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 propositions that you need to have. Um, and, and then that has to be brought into a conversation uh, with, with human biology and science in an age of acceleration. And I've already uh, referenced for you, uh, Prigogini and, and, and Stengers. And so, um, you know, the question that I pose to myself, because I, I like Ghazali a lot and, and, I, and I read his work carefully, I would then say that, you know, some of the, the ways in which we determine death and some of the fatwas to my mind are very mechanistic. In other words, they, they almost like kind of you put in this, that is the output. So it is like lacking complexity. So I would ask the question, right? What would Ghazali do, right? How would Ghazali tackle this? Because I think Ghazali is fairly sophisticated. I mean, his beef with the philosophers uh, is something that um, we can argue with him. I, I think he was unnecessarily harsh with the Muslim philosophers there. Ibn Rush said that there is flexibility on those issues and he should have gone in that direction of flexibility. But nevertheless, that is a separate issue. I would say that someone like Ghazali would take contemporary knowledge of human biology, physics, science, and his tradition that he thinks is, an, is a living tradition, not an ossified tradition, and begin to think about these issues in, in an integrated and complex way. I would say, for instance, as, I, as I'm working uh, my way into the, the material and thinking about this question of human dignity and human personhood, that is where I'm coming out. If you look at, in, in the fatwas, this question of that Muslim theologians like E.G. and Georgiani and others have discussed 
which where they call, uh, you know, they talk about the qualities, the quality of the soul, or the qualities of a sentient human, of human life. Kefiyat nafsaniya. These debates hardly come into any of the conversations that we have on Fatawa literature. The juristic theology hardly ventures into what is actually traditional. And, you know, and there's an elaborate debate um, of, you know, that these Muslim theologians have on the question of what is life? One, hayat, what is knowledge? How do we know knowledge? Knowledge is always a third is the question of will, irada. And the fourth is capacity, qudra. Now the jurists think about qudra in a, you know, in, in a very kind of mechanistic and technical way. Here they think, uh, these Muslim, uh, e.g. and Georgiani, they think about capacity in a kind of philosophical way. And you know, by, 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 by their time, uh, like Taftazani in the 14th century said, the distinction between theology and philosophy is basically, you know, uh, indistinguishable. Um, these areas have, have, have merged in ways. And I find E.G. and Giorgiani to be very open to philosophical thinking. Then there are secondary, secondary debates uh, regarding questions of uh, the qualities of a sentient life. They talk about questions of pleasure and pain and how one experiences those things. Very, very elaborate debates that has hardly been brought into the conversation of Muslim bioethics and the questions of, of, of knowing and science. And so that's where, where I am heading uh, in, 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 in some of my uh, uh, ongoing uh, uh, discussions. I, I shared with you, for instance, some, some relevant parts of say the work of uh, someone like Shawalullah, who obviously thinks in a kind of platonic, uh, platonic uh, uh, idiom and his, his, his vocabulary is kind of platonic and the how he thinks about the relationship between the spirit, the ruh, and the soul, the nafs. Um, and as I've learned from Ghazali and also someone like Shawalullah, they would talk about the spirit, that is the ruh, the soul, the nafs, uh, the heart, the qalb. Uh, they would think of these things as kind of as, as, a, as a complex, as sometimes meaning the same thing and sometimes have differential uh, tasks and, and functions. You know, different function and how they relate to the body, and you know, and and um, well, Yula is very clear that how do we know that the spirit has parted the body, which is real death? He said when the body ceases to spontaneously generate itself, and we know that a brain dead body can no longer spontaneously generate. Yes, it does generate some nails and some hair, which is kind of kind of already there and as the body exhausts itself, when you even put a body into the grave for several days, that body was, the nails will still grow and the hair will still grow. There's just the vegetative side of the human body that, 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 that grows in that way. But Walilo had a clear, clear idea that when the body ceases to spontaneously generate to lead itself, he thinks that that had sent in. So, you know, would, would, would the Walula and a Ghazali uh, agree with me? Uh, you know, and, and they, he gives a longer conversation that they don't want to rehearse out here because my, I think we are clo closing on to my 30 minutes. <clears throat> um, I mean, very interestingly, well, you'll have a, 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 the Indian thinker who died in uh, 1762, um, you know, the Quran says, and this is very interesting that we can learn from, you know, some of the uh, noteworthy traditionalists. The Quran says, yes, yes, aluna ka'ani ruh, they ask you about the soul. Kuli ruh min amli rabbi, right? Say that the soul is, um, uh, 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 is, is, it comes from the order of my Lord uh, uh, and you have been given very little knowledge of it. Now on this a surface reading of this means you need to shut up when you talk about the soul, right? That's what most people would say. You, you know, says, no, that's not the case. You need to think about this. He says, this was a, a put down. This verse was a put down. It was to shut up some vexatious uh, questioner that was posed to the prophet. Can you tell us about this? But he says, no, you, it doesn't mean that one cannot speak intelligently about the spirit. He understands that human beings have thought about the spirit 
for millennia. We have thought about it from the ancients and and until now we think about the spirit. Okay, modern modern people, secular people don't want to talk about the spirit because they don't believe in the spirit. They don't believe in the ruh. Okay, they don't think there's any kind of material evidence for it. But even now, some are coming around that they cannot fully explain consciousness. Right? You look at people like Ramachandra, uh, who is a big, uh, you know, neuro ne neuroscientist, um, and you ask he, when you ask him about questions about consciousness, uh, he said that's a philosophical issue. Right? He doesn't want to pronounce in it because as a, but philo philosoph philosophers have have delved a great deal into the question of consciousness, which has some link to the question of of the spirit, the ruh. Um, and, you know, and, they, and you know, while Yula's kind of answer in terms of his hermeneutical moves that he makes, which I find so impressive, he says, the verse is not a univocal or an explicit text. It is not a nos stating that no one from, from the community on whom, God's, God, on whom is God's mercy will acquire knowledge pertaining to the reality of the spirit as it is assumed. That, that's page 104. For it does not mean that everything on which the revelation, the shar, is silent, Therefore, it is absolutely impossible to have knowledge of such a matter, right? He has to remind it all because, you know, I'm sure by his time also people say when the revelation is silent. Normally, when the revelation is silent on some matter, you have freedom to discuss it. But here, on the surface and a very superficial reading of this verse, might might people might be get the, get, get the sense that you are not supposed to talk about the spirit. But Valula has a hermeneutic to say, you need to understand in what context that verse was revealed, it was in order to, sh to shut certain vex sections of the community, uh, vexatious uh, questions that were trying to trap the prophet on these issues. Therefore, the verse was revealed, but it's not a verse that says that you cannot explore that. Rather, he says many of the things about which the revelation is silent actually require sophisticated knowledge. And it is not appropriate to share this knowledge with the entire multitude, while it is possible to share it with some of them. So he does believe, okay, so he's still in, in, in that world where the multitude, the awam and the khawas was the distinction that is the, the learned elites and the, and the multitude. And you have, because that can confuse the multitude. That was the, the position in the previous time today with growing amounts of literacy. Although I, I worry about growing amounts of literacy because if, if anything, this pandemic has shown that people have become such deniers and literacy is absolutely, when it comes to questions of science and, and religion and theology, and it's not only in the Muslim community, it's, a, it's I wonder about literacy. I wonder about literacy. I mean, billions of dollars spent uh, on scientific endeavors and putting the human being on, on the moon and landing buggies on, on Mars and doing all this spectacular stuff, we still can't persuade human beings that taking some kind of precaution through a vaccination is a good thing for you. And I have family members who are, who are vaccine deniers. I mean, they've all become overnight experts uh, uh, for the last, uh, in the last 18 months. Nevertheless, so, so uh, but I think what Yula's point holds. So um, I think that, um, you know many of the the issues that I've I, I've stated in my position in kind of a a, a summary summary way. I really would welcome uh, you know uh, deeper engagement uh, or questions uh, with the text and uh, and and your and your critical reflections. I I would really welcome that. So, uh, Dr. Tayyip, back to you. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, Ibrahim. It's really, I think it's a really nice way of you know, almost uh, you know, giving us a good sense of the paper and also leaving out some, some of, uh, at least uh, um, opening up the, 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 the forum for the question, for questions. Um, so the floor is open. Um, okay. I thought there was... Yeah, there's a first question already I see from Shahid. You can, you, yeah, you can just unmute yourself and yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you. Thanks so much for the, for the talk and the paper. It was really fascinating. I had the advantage of reading last week, mistaking the date and then 
uh, preparing way in advance. So <laughs> okay. <laughs> thank, 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 thank you, Shay. Good to see you, Shay. For, for a while. So I just got like, they are interrelated. I want to start with you. So this is one of the things. I wanted to ask you about this multitude. So it relates to this question of science. I mean, I get, I, I can follow how you are, how you're presenting the argument, you know, and it's all, it's all fine, but I'm wondering about the status of science. So firstly, the uncertainty that these kind of philosophers of science speak about in terms of a new, you know, this new kind of um, vista, and it seems to be a lot to do with astrophysics and, you know, very, very cutting edge kind of, kind of new ideas. But that uncertainty, is that not a new kind of certainty? You know, a new kind of certainty that the world is now like this. It's emerging, it's moving. And so, so that was the one thing. So because I know, because I know you play a lot with certainty and uncertainty and the kind of the ethics of that. And then related to that, I'm wondering about this multitude because I know you say, okay, you're fine. We need to tell people what you're back to. We also don't know what to do. But now the thing is that kind of knowledge, right? That we take from the philosophy of science of a particular status, but science, Science in the contemporary world, again, is, is, is a very powerful discourse, right? Um, again, I think it's, for me at least, I mean, I always think of it as something to do with certainty, with controlling the world, with, you know? And even though we are now in a new mode of science, still, the claim is still the same, to do it in this new way. So, yeah, I guess, and, 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 I'm, and I'm wondering about this in, in relation, because I was thinking, I mean, obviously, as an anthropologist, right, I'm trying to think about how these discourses have to do with the modern state and the modern state, right? The multitude now being the democratic masses, uh, you know, the whole thing about like, I think you mentioned it, but you know, the medical anthropology and the public policy and things like that. So in that sense, yeah, there's a kind of, I don't know, this, the science is doing something, right? And I'm wondering about the old system. And that's what I want to ask you, you know, when you speak about them talking about certainty in a closed system, what did they understand, what did they understand about this and the ethics, the ethics of it? Okay, that's all. Okay, thanks very much. I think there's going to be a lot of questions. You can always come back if, we, if you don't manage to ask all your questions. I think, I don't know how do you want to do it. Uh, no, uh, let's uh, do uh, respond. Maybe, maybe I, I, I can respond and maybe that will open up more what's name and, and I'll try to um, be as brief. How, how, how much time do you have Abukar, for the session? We. We've got an, we've got another half an hour to forty five minutes. Okay, good. Thank you. Depending so, on you, um, it depends on you as well. What are okay, your, what okay, is your... good, good, good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I, I can stay. I can stay for an hour. It's no problem. Okay. So, um, uh, Shahid, that's a really interesting question and an important question that you're asking. So, um, so yes, it's, it's not only philosophy of science and astrophysics, but also evolutionary biology, right? Evolutionary biology has also you know, complicated the story. So I think you're right that the new kind of certainty, if we follow that, that philosophy of science that I, that I referred to, then contingency is the order. Everything is contingent, right? Uh, there's a contingency is that. And you know, in history, contingency is important, even though some you know, philosophers of history like to give us grand narratives and so on and so forth. Um, but they are always punctured by, you know, the contingency and what made that change possible and so on. So I think they, and I think the Mullah Sadra quote about fluidity of being and change and so on and so forth, uh, let you know uh, that it's someone like Mullah Sadra uh, as kind of, kind of one of the major uh, doyans of, of Muslim philosophy and was widely read on in the Indian subcontinent, including Shaul and others and so on, <clears throat> gives them a, a lot of you know, leverage and, and ways to work with. So, so, so that's the one thing. So I agree with you. The new kind of certainty is contingency. Contin everything is contingent upon stuff. And that is also because of the volume of knowledge or our exposure of how much we know now about, about the natural world and how much we also realize we do not know, right? I think the environmental crisis also shows us how much, how much we don't know and, and so on. So, so I think it's both a, a celebratory moment, but also a humbling moment, right? <clears throat> so, so contingency is that to tell you also that we don't always know, and therefore we have to be careful. 
the question of science literacy uh, uh, to, oh, let me just continue with, with on, on that line. The way I think the medievals thought about uh, the pre-modern world, both in different cultures, Western as well as Islamic culture, was that what we call the epistemological virtues. The epistemological virtue, in other words, what is it in the, in, in, in what is that grid through which the, the individual looks at the world? What is that, what does that grid look like? What is that filter look like? So I think for a long time, human beings thought about, you know, truth to nature. We made the correspondence of truth to nature correspondence. Uh, in other words, whatever nature has, and if we can decipher what nature has, then that is truth. It's almost kind of unmediated understanding of what nature was, right? Uh, so therefore people say, you know, uh, you know, especially people who are very ecologically minded and so on, they would talk about, you know, uh, how great nature is and how wonderful nature is and so on and so on. But we have since moved from that position because nature is, nature is mediated through a variety of ways in which we see it and our seeing and our, the mediation. So we, at one stage we had objectivity now that came in and there's a, you know, there's a massive uh, a book by uh, Lorraine Daston called Objectivity, you know, almost 600 pages on the, on the whole history of, of science on this question. So there are different kinds of epistemological virtues at work. And so I think one of the things that we need to do in, uh, since the seminar is about Islamic ethics and so on, we need to see that, you know, what is Ghazali's epistemological virtue? What is Razi's epistemological virtue? What is Shatibi's epistemological virtue? I say that because Professor Khalid got his hand up and he's the Shatibi and, uh, and so on. So, um, so, you know, how, what is the epistemological virtue? What, is, what are the epistemological lenses to which they see that? Those micro studies still need to be done. Uh, we can't just, yeah, you can get one, uh, you know, hint of it in a text, but you need to study, read more so that you can get a more complex picture of what the epistemological virtue is. <clears throat> As to the question of the, yes, of course, the medieval world was hierarchical, Shahid, and the hier hierarchy was between the elites and the and, and the multitude. So um, we, I think we, we have entered a different phase in human history in which we make, uh, you know, egalitarianism an aspiration. Um, we still struggle with it, uh, even in the, the, the most democratic societies and the most egalitarian societies, uh, uh, there are still battles that need to be, need to be, need to be uh, uh, fought and so on. I think the, the question here comes about the nature of science literacy. And you are right, I don't think one can convince everybody about science literacy because there's so much contingency and someone else, another expert will give you an, another viewpoint. And therefore, when that viewpoint goes into the public domain, uh, you know, it has its own uh, power of conviction and people will then uh, buy into that. Or, you know, uh, you see here physicians who are uh, anti-vaxxers and they, they speak very loudly about, about, about their position. Um, the question is, can we get into the public domain a sophisticated science literacy, right? Now, the other thing is also that what we have in our mediatized world, in our mediatized world, there's a high levels of skepticism about information and who's saying what, right? And it's sometimes associated with wokeness. It is sometimes associated with, with right-wing skepticism, with left-wing, you know, the anti-vaxxers are both right-wing and left-wing, right? For different kinds of political agendas because so knowledge and knowing is not free from, from politics. In the same way that in Ghazali's world, his disagreement with the Muslim theologian, uh, Muslim philosophers was not free from politics. The way he saw the Ismailis and the way the threat the Ismailis were posing, therefore his political positions also, you know, uh, as much as he, he loved the kind of esoteric philosophy uh, and, and mysticism, he was also seeing the dangers of that, and that was politically driven. That's a separate story. So anyway, uh, I, I don't think we can take knowledge to be separate from the question of the political question of power. 
uh, and who's speaking and what is speaking. But one of the question is, can we introduce a, a sophisticated public literacy, number one, and number two is we still have to deal, we have still have to deal at some point with practical wisdom, back to Aristotle, practical wisdom, what is the right thing to do now, right? And for that, you need persuasion and you need, con you need persuasion and you need to develop consensus. Okay, so, so that's how I would say, and I, I don't think the question of separating the multitude from the experts is, 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 is there, but I think sometimes the experts ought not to confuse the multitude, right? And, and therefore we need to work very hard in, 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 in getting our message through in a, both a sophisticated way without also, uh, you know, scaring uh, people and making them vulnerable to, to fear. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ibrahim. So we are we going back to the arm and the chas then? Sorry. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes, yes. Looking yes. Okay. Uh, I'll just keep the conversation going and ask uh, Professor Khalid uh, to uh, ask you to ask a question or comment. Khalid, sir, please. You have to unmute yourself. You must unmute yourself, Professor Khalid. Is it okay? Yes, 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 we can hear you. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. First of all, I thank you for giving this opportunity uh, for two reasons, because uh, uh, Professor Musa has uh, introduced Ghazali's other sides, many sides. And I think that's, uh, that's why my question, in my uh, mind, the question is, uh, he did not mention the Savo for mysticism at all. Uh, I think that that is where uh, Shah Waliullah becomes relative, uh, relevant. Uh, my, my problem is with the concept of uh, certainty and ambiguity. I, I think the certainty, as Shahid has raised the question, because the science, scientific studies or science claimed certainty so much that even the philosophers uh, uh, toil on finding certainty uh, became uh, secondary. But I think what, uh, what is common in both is that both are some way closer to theology or metaphysics. By metaphysics, I mean that to, to define certainty, to define measures for certainty, they have to go into something which is created and not uh, something like uh, natural, uh, like metaphysics. They, they, are, they are different aluminum sal that the scientists have uh, uh, created. For instance, uh, mathematics. I mean, all these uh, numbers and all these are give you certainty, but they are like, uh, Missile, certain they are certain because they are given that value. In the now, world of images, in the world of images, Alam al yes. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think this uh, uh, world of images uh, with the sociologist and uh, modern political scientists uh, who became with the term of imagination, imagined community, world, sociological imagination and all that, I think if the, we, we keep to the word imagination or imagined, then we do not fall into the trap of that certainty. Because I think we need as humans, some kind of uh, ambiguity. In law, we, uh, we have to make law general so that it uh, remains applicable. If it is too strict like codified law in the modern period, we have problems. Now. With that, I go back to that I think we, sh we need to study mysticism not uh, in the, uh, for re religion or for theology, uh, but for going into the uh, study of ruh, study of nafs, uh, more experiment, like, lo like having local uh, uh, personal experience. So they have come up with certain suggestions, not oh, as scientific as they are, but they are helpful uh, for scientific studies because physics in the last uh, uh, journey is coming up with the, uh, 
mystical words like beauty, harmony, uh, for all these phenomena that they are facing. So my question actually is that uh, when uh, Ghazali went into Tasavvu, he went into with the, into it with metaphysics. When he was uh, when he was criticizing philosophy, he was criticizing metaphysics actually. But then he went into uh, philosophy, then came back and wrote this uh, uh, Usul al fiqh or jurisprudence, which where he very clearly said that Islamic theology is the epistemology, is the, is the basic science for everything. So certainty again was given to theology, to logic, to philosophy, which my, for me is still a problem because they are as human as anything can be. Uh, and uh, they are also uh, human made in the imagination. So, uh, uh, I will leave with this question that this falsafatul ula uh, is actually comes from the question uh, which is discussed by Ibn Taymiyyah, Shatabi, and many others that there are two worlds. One is world of Amr, which uh, is uh, uh, still not definable, but what what is very uh, uh, very unphysical or metaphysical or beyond physics, and the other is khalq, creation. And there is a lahul khalq wal amr is a, is the uh, is the capacity or the power of God that is uh, being defined in theology. And th these are two worlds. And Ibn Taymiyyah and Shatubi have talking about it, uh, talked about it. And I think that uh, it is where uh, Iqbal and uh, some of the modern uh, people who were interested in uh, Sufism uh, tried to enter into this second world. And uh, Ibn uh, Iqbal was even saying that uh, it is like a scientific study of religion is only uh, through uh, philosophy, uh, through uh, tasawwur. What I meant is, what I understand from it is that this is actually study of mind, study of imagination, study of human thinking in a, in a, uh, in a uncertain, in the world of uncertainty. So I think it's not, uh, we cannot come up and I, I myself have not come up with any uh, clear or uncertain, uh, or with certain thoughts, but I think there is a whole world that has been, uh, through their experiences, through their deliberations, the Sufis have provided for us. And maybe if we can go into that, then life and uh, uh, death and uh, uh, actually uh, I come to believe with the Iqbal that uh, uh, in, in Islamic thought, body and spirit are not two different things or physics and metaphysics are not two different things. So brain and heart, I mean, all these divisions are because we uh, do uh, differentiate between sacred and profane. Uh, I don't know whether this makes sense, but uh, hearing Professor uh, Ibrahim Musa, always these kinds of questions come to mind, which are hard for me and I need help for clarification. Thank you. Uh, th thank you, Professor Masood. Uh, it's so, so kind of you to, um, uh, uh, to, to pose this question. Yeah, these are, uh, I don't think I've resolved uh, some of these questions. They are still a work in progress for me. Um, but I think you are, you are onto something. Um, so, you know, your, your comments, I, I can, you know, uh, align myself with many of your comments. And I think what, what one, one of the things that Unfortunately, the way sometimes metaphysics is presented and philosophy is presented as if they are, you know, absolute mm. absolutes. Whereas you absolutely you are absolutely right. I want to say absolute truth. That, the, that no, but I want to say that you are absolutely right in saying that they are products of the human imagination. 
the, the these are imaginal and they are they are related to imaginal world so example of mathematics related to the imaginal world of mathematics it's kind of a uh, uh, question of um uh uh uh, it's a question of, of, of you know, uh, the platonic idea of forms and how that, how that relate the Muslims uh, bought into that. And then, you know, the, 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 the way in which Aristotelians thought about those issues is that, you know, uh, things can be relativized, things can be put into relationship with each other. Uh, uh, and so, you know, a whole, whole range of, of issues uh, come, in, come into play. So I think you, you are, um, I'm with you in that, you know, what is the world of Amr? Um, uh, is that a, a, a unseen world? Is that the, what we call the metaphysical world? Is that the, the realm of the imagine, imagination? And you're absolutely right, you know, the, the, the Muslim Sufis, I mean, found great uh, you know, strength and energy out of the imaginal worlds, and Ibn Arabi is a prime example of that. But there are also others, and even someone like someone like Ghazali sometimes, you know, plays uh, on questions of the imagination. So I think um, I'm agreeing with you um, that the mind and imagination uh, uh, is possibly very much associated um, with the way in way human thinking takes place, and also religious thinking. Um, you, you know, um, uh, the, the way in which, for instance, the Quran and the Muslim tradition and the prophetic hadith talk about, say, for instance, gender relationships, um, it's part of the way in which men and women were imagined in a particular culture. And, and then, you know, these, these cultural, you know, um, uh, manifestations or, or forms of imagining become part of a of a, of a philosophical and theological uh, uh, narrative. Uh, so for instance, you know, um, I think Kisha Ali and some others uh, in their work, for instance, look at Shafi'i and, and Shafi'i is asked the question, um, if a man can cohabit with his concubines, why can't a woman owner of a slave have conjugal rights with her male slave that she owns. And Shafi's answer is, um, that's the only response he has, that the male is the active partner and the woman is the passive partner. That's how he, he makes that into a axiom. He makes that, makes that into a philosophical uh, and, and, and doctrinal axiom on which he thinks that is the way truth is imagined. He thinks of gender in active and passive forms, right? <laughs> and, and obviously these are very much culturally produced. So even, even the, the kind of, you know, the, cult, the, the imaginal worlds of the Sufis or Muslim, Muslim uh, theologians and jurists of the past, uh, those imagine, imagine, imaginal worlds continuously to mutate because, you know, science tells us a different cosmological story and that cosmological story in, in very many ways also uh, is altered. We no longer believe in a, in a cosmos where the planetary system was imagined in a particular way. Now we've reached out to it, we've touched it, we feel it, we test it. And so it's become a whole different cosmos now an open-ended cosmos and so on. So, uh, and, and, no, and what, what, what previously we thought that the cosmic, uh, you know, the planetary systems and those relationships had power over the human soul. It might still have power over the human soul uh, as, you know, there's a, there's a great resurgence in, uh, in the study of the occult and the Islamic occult and, and philosoph philosophizing the occult. There's been a great resurgence of that in various studies. Um, and I, I, I hope to familiarize myself with that with that debate. I'm not fully, uh, you know, uh, on, onto it. Um, but 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 you know, I think the the scientific cosmos is the one that we, by which we live by and really determines our life, uh, our, our lives in, in in significant ways. So I, I, all I can say, is I'm in agreement with you that these metaphysical systems and philosophical systems are related to. The real worlds in which you live and they keep on mutating and shifting and therefore 
I, I am so taken by uh, the, the foresight of someone like Mullah Sadra of how he thought about, you know, Sayalan uh, al-Wujud and the understanding of Wujud as, as fluid and open to change and also perish. And now, you know, there are going to be different interpreters of, 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 of uh, Mullah Sadra and they might think that, you know, I've taken Mullah Sadra in a particular direction and others would take Mullah Sadra in, in another direction. So, you know, there, there are going to be fights about how one reads Mullah Sadra too. So thank you, Professor Khalid. So and, and thank you. I... And let me just thank Professor Khalid. He uh, he spent some uh, good time with our uh, Madrasa discourses students in in Bhurban uh, in Pakistan. They truly enjoyed it, and I'm very grateful for your presence there. I feel deprived that I I couldn't join them there. Okay. Yeah, I think that was also an important project. It's still, the project, as I assume, is still continuing and raising these kind of issues with the Olama uh, teachers. Yes. yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I, before I ask, I hand over to Haider Shadi. Um, let me just make a small comment on, on, I think, the conversation now. And I wanted to have some clarification on this. Mm -hmm. I mean, from the philosophers uh, of science, uh, the ones that you actually mentioned, they seem to be, as you said in your opening remarks, you know, presenting a, dis a, 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 a difference between a closed and an open a science, open idea of conception of science. But when I was looking at the materials that you presented, certainly of Shah Waliullah and uh, Ghazali, I sort of didn't uh, think of them as you know, presenting a closed system. So I'm wondering whether there's a difference between you know, a, a sort of a traditional uh, medieval understanding of an open system. I mean, it's obviously not, uh, you know, has not, has, it's not exactly what, what we are thinking about right now. But I think that by definition, it is an open system because of the will of God or, or some other, or, or the whole lot of unknown factors. So would you perhaps say that, you know, the Muslim scholars that you had, you know, originally, you know, opened your talk with, and you said that, you know, they're giving either yes or no answer, perhaps their understanding is fairly, of science is fairly close. Perhaps they are much more Newtonian than they are you know, at least in the conception of science or in the conception of the world, then they are, you know, uh, Islamic in the in the in, in the in the sense of the Islamic literary tradition. You know, the, the philosophy and the Sufism, because that has always been a continuous debate and discussion going around. And even in the substance, they basically have some a kind of an openness because they don't know. I mean, maybe um, whereas. You know the the, the debate uh, in the in the what seems to be the debate in the modern scholars is between the kind of a Einsteinian or quantum physics and a and a and a Newtonian science. So, but you can you can comment on that if you like uh, later. I'm going to ask mm -hmm. uh, Haider to, to speak. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Haider Shadi, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks, Dr. Uh, Musa, for this very interesting and important lecture. Uh, my point is about uh, the methodology. Actually, you criticized uh, the approach, the dominant approach in fiqh about uh, modern normative uh, questions, including mythical ethics. I had uh, somehow similar experience uh, in war ethics. I, I'm having a research project on Islamic war ethics in Germany. Uh, it's uh, based in a Catholic uh, research center for um, theology and uh, peace. So when I started uh, the literature review on war, Islamic war ethics, I also uh, saw that there is the dominant approach is the fiqhi approach about jihad and uh, jihad ibtidai, uh, difai, etc. Uh, but my Catholic colleagues were usually talking when they were talking about uh, Christian war ethics, etc., about Thomas Aquinas, uh, just war theory, uh, Augustine. And then I had the question so, the equal for Augustine and Aquinas are Farabi, Ibn Sina, Ibn Rushd. Why nobody talks about the 
Islamic ethics, uh, Islamic uh, war ethics from a philosophical point of view. Then I went to study that and I saw that actually we can talk about somehow a kind of war ethics in Farabi, Ibn Rushd, etc. Uh, but later I saw that also Jewish uh, modern normative debates have a similar situation. You know, halakha in Jewish uh, culture. This is very similar to fiqh. And I saw also a, a halakha center, halakha medical, halakha medical center in, uh, in uh, Israel. So it is very similar. Uh, so then now the question is that, uh, it seems that the, uh, the fiqh approach that we have in Islamic culture, so the, the scripture is based for this uh, scholarship and they usually talk, so what the Quran or Hadith says about these normative questions. And this is different than, for example, ethical approach that we know in uh, Greek uh, uh, tradition. Uh, though now the question is whether uh, we can now demand a kind of theologization and philosophization of fiqh and ask fuqaha for their philosophical or theological discussions about life, death in medical ethics, or about uh, violence and power when it comes to war ethics, or we should um, acknowledge the normative diversity in Islamic civilization. It means that there is a scriptural normative culture that comes from which is Semitic. You know, we saw you see it in Jewish and Islamic. There is this philosophical approach, which is the reception of Greek philosophy. We see it uh, in Farabi, Khajana Sirit, Dunutusi, etc. There is a mystic and Sufi normative culture. We may also talk about a kind of wisdom literature, which comes specifically in war, peace ethics, Nasihatul Muluk and Siyasat Nama comes from Indian, Iranian. So this, this normative diversity, which is a kind of reflection of the uh, intellectual diversity in Islamic civilization, uh, one point for confirming this diversity, normative diversity is Hajina Sidi Dintusi himself. You know, he wrote several books on ethics, Akhlaq Nasiri, Awsaf al Ashraf, and each is in one normative culture. Akhlaq Nasiri is the philosophical ethics, Awsaf al Ashraf, and uh, the other is Akhlaq Muhtashami. Uh, so, my question is uh, when we want to deal with the problem. So this mechanical approach that we see in fiqh, in, it is in all applied ethics. So uh, medical ethics, business, business ethics, sexual ethics, war ethics. Here, we should we somehow make a hybrid uh, now methodology and uh, as I told, uh, philosophize, theologize fiqh, or we should just say there are diverse normative cultures that they can uh, somehow have interaction, but they should keep their independence as we see in uh, Haji Nasir. Thank you, that's, thank, a, you, that's, a, that, that, thank you. That's, a, that's a great uh, summary of the state of uh, uh, the study of, of Muslim ethics that you just provided. So. Uh, and, and I cannot agree with it. The reason I was smiling at the beginning uh, when you were telling your story is that, you know, you go to ethics conferences or uh, things and in the Jewish colleagues quote Rab Rabbi Akiba and they quote Maimonides and, and there are hundreds of books written on Maimonides and on Rabbi Akida, uh, Akiba and uh, whether Rabbi Akiva uh, uh, is real or not, that's also debated, but people quote him and they have text and detailed stuff. And, uh, and, and, and the Christian uh, talks about Augustine said this, and there's a thousands of works on 
one idea of Augustine on this idea of time and on Aquinas, tens of thousands. And then comes the poor Muslim scholar and says, the Quran says so and the Hadith says so. And he just gives them the, uh, and people must be satisfied. It's a conversation stopper. It's not a conversation uh, uh, you know, generator. Because now who's going to argue with the Quran and who's going to argue with your understanding of the Quran, right? Uh, even, even Christians and Jews have learned not to debate with Muslims about the Quran and the, and the Hadith because they, Muslims may take offense. Sometimes we say Ghazali said, and then he's also taken one line of the Ghazali, but we don't have, so what, what does it show is the poverty of our scholarship. We don't have in-depth scholarship. Everybody who starts with a topic has to go back to, you know, point zero. We don't have accumulation of scholarship. Um, uh, we have some, but we are still far away uh, compared to others and so on. And if I keep on telling, you know, Professor Khalid uh, Masood knows, knows well, and when I talk to people in, on the subcontinent who are extremely skeptical about Islamic education at the universities and so on and so forth, and they say, you know, the, the main thing is that, you know, in Western universities, when Islam is taught, it is all Orientalism. I tell them, okay, leave alone on the Orientalism. Do you know how do you have anything the equivalent of what people have in Western universities, the smallest college, where there's one or two professors studying the Greek, Greek legacy, the Roman legacy, the classics, they're writing books on it and they get rewarded for it, they get grants for it. And at university like Notre Dame, there are people like 20 and 30, Harvard, all the major places, people put millions of dollars of resources into to generate knowledge about a culture that is, you know, a thousand years, uh, you know, past. Do we have the equivalent of that? Then obviously there's silence because we, we don't have that. So therefore, and obviously what you have referred to, there's a new trend emerging. Obviously the, the kind of, you know, even the learned Salafi tradition that has now come out, even, you know, things that Muhammad Abdul and Rashid Rida circulated, you know, because they, they found that the traditional scholars of their time were not, were not able to move with the tradition. So then, they said, you know, back to the Quran and Hadith. And so with a little bit of the tradition going in there, so people have become accustomed to and lay Muslim audiences become convinced and they get mesmerized if you can spin a verse of the Quran and the Hadith and interpret it as if it was revealed for today's you know, challenge. And people would go back and they'd be so pleased that great, wow, the Quran has all the answers. So that is still the kind of, you know, the background thing that, Muslim communities and scholarship to labor that the Quran has all the answers, the tradition has all the answers. They, we need to be honest and say, no, the answers lies in the human soul and through human experience, relying on the ancient wisdom of, that, that the Quran is provided. And the Quran at the time when it gives pictures, images of nature, of, of, of practices and so on, it's an it's a image of a particular time and place. Uh, and, and obviously it's very hard to have that conversation with Muslim audiences that it is for a particular time and place and say, well, isn't the Quran meant to be eternal? No, uh, it, it, Quran is, it's, its wisdom is eternal, but it depends how the Muslim interpreter applies it, okay? So, so therefore you need scholarship, therefore you need tradition. You need the thick learned tradition to sustain the wisdom of the Quran, the prophetic wisdom and the wisdom of the Muslim community historically. So. That was just by way of you know come some of my complaints. Your question was um, um, the methodology. So you're right. You know, so you know, Tusi writes under different different registers. He's not he's not like say someone like Ghazali who mixes things up, right? Ghazali mixes things up, brings in philosophical, uh, sometimes uh, gingerly some mystical insights or quotes and authority with a strong mystical bend to make his argument. So I think the, the way uh, I would think about, and also applied ethics, right? In the text I provided you, I quote you, you know, um, uh, Bihari's text where he says that, you know, that fiqh can also be seen as hikmah, right? Fiqh is also seen as hikmah. He's a, he's a 18th century, um, you know, Indian uh, scholar who under Orange Zeb Simon wrote a, a major tract on, on legal theory. Uh, so there is that thing working. What I, what I would say that, you know, when we have applied ethics, there's always encyclopedias of philosophy behind that applied ethical conclusion. 
Um, and even if you do, um, what's that uh, term that you, that you think about, you know, the situational ethics, or when you think about um, solving the problem, the problem solving approach, um, then, then there is, there's, a, there's a method about thinking, there's a philosophical uh, approach behind that. Uh, what I what I see lacking in the study of uh, of Muslim ethics are these kind of layers of of development. I know Professor Attar is is editing a part of a, a, a you know an editorial board that is trying to generate an encyclopedia uh, uh, or a handbook on on Muslim ethics, and some of these will 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 begin to address some of the, these challenges. But we need these micro studies, as you said. So I would say, uh, you know, I think you need interdisciplinarity i think our world is interdisciplinary and so with it, when it, when two sees mystical insight is philosophical insight uh, and you know these insights are all can talk to each other and that would help us in the same way that we do today you know when we when we take a decision whether it's in the political sphere or in the ethical sphere there are multiple things that 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 uh, con uh, condensations uh, in in our particular moment of exploration, and uh, therefore we need to you know think about in these kind of complex ways. Um, so that's I would say the methodological approach. At least my preferred one would be interdisciplinary and complexity, uh, because what that would do is to it will help us frame the question more succinctly, rather than necessarily finding the answer. Because I think finding the answers are difficult, but I think if we understand the question and we can make the show that the, the, the question has multiple dimensions that at least we can strive to answer. You answer one dimension, I will answer another, someone else will do another. And then at, after time, we can begin to see the, the multiple possibilities of an answer from the various dimensions. Just to uh, Professor Tayyip's question. Yeah, you raised an interesting question about, you know, was Ghazali's system or, you know, really closed? So, you know, I mean, it would be the famous, you know, answer that Ibn, Ibn Arabi gave to uh, Ibn Rushd, you know, you know, is knowledge, uh, um, revelatory knowledge, um, uh, is, does it have a relationship to discursive knowledge? And Ibn Arabi said, yes and no, la wa na'am, right? Uh, so, so I think I would, I, would, I, would, I would make that move and say, uh, yes and no. I think I think when it came to the imaginal world, it was a kind of open one. I think in in terms of Ghazali, the imaginal world. But I think if he thought, I think in his time, the idea of the na the nature of the planetary system compared to with the way we know it today, possibly was much more enveloped and much more closer. I, I would have thought. Um, and and I think when you when you say that you know the will of God can interrupt. You know um, the system, so so I think it's precisely because they have a closed system. They believe that that system can be punctured by God, right? Um, so therefore, Ghazali can justify miracles uh, based on kind of Greek understanding of of matter. That if God wants to intervene in matter, God can shift the matter in this direction or that direction, right? Uh, and inter intervene in order to justify a miracle. Uh, I think the German word is Tomzain, right? Um, uh, and and you know this intervention in matter uh, to 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 shift the the normal capacity of, of of matter in a different direction. So I think that that to that extent, God can intervene and make nature contingent for God's purposes, but that it would be divine contingency. Right uh, or divine divine intervention to make the world contingent. Otherwise, I think Ghazali and the Muslim f f theologians and philosophers would normally accept the kind of and what we would call a natural order by the general rules of how we understand uh, that. Um, so I, I think the the, the the folks that I'm complaining about about the tools is that either literacy and science is, 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 is wanting, or if is a literacy of theology uh, and, and science, we don't see it manifesting 
in, in complexity in, in, in the fatwa. So that is the complaint or familiarity of the tradition's position of these issues. Uh, and maybe it is done with a good reason that because these fatwas are for public circulation, it may have a straight answer, yes and no, and um, putting too much information in there could result in, in confusing the masses. That's generally the trend um, amongst traditional Muslim scholars who are handing out information to kind of in a kind of authoritative way that, you know, you don't want to confuse people, give them a straight answer. And you don't even, I mean, Professor Khalid would know um, that in the past, you don't even have to give your, you don't even have to give your proof why you say yes or no. You just have to say, you know, Raddul Muhtar says, you know, uh, or you say, so you quote an authority or you quote a book. Um, you don't have to give your proof text because the tradition was, is viewed as, authentic, true, and self-sustained. So they don't have to go do it. Uh, but I think what I'm asking is that they need to share the literacy of how they reach their position with, uh, with other, uh, with broader audiences, because I think people want to know uh, and want to know how you arrive at your position and what is your justification. Yeah. So thank you very much. Um, I don't know if there are any other questions. Um, I don't see any, and I also see some people leaving because of uh, Maharibia and uh, especially in Cape Town. But yes, uh, yes. yeah, so I, I don't I see know that Sitoto, you... Sitoto and others are there too. Yeah, on this show. Yeah, on this yeah. Show. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, if I could, as a chairperson, slip one more question in, I was yes, thinking yes, about it. So, oh. um, I mean, one of the things that. I mean, there is a, even with the, like mentioned Ramachandra and I read recently another essay, very interesting essay on, you know, what is consciousness? And at the end of the day, the race is on, you know, to use the MRI to actually identify, uh, you know, what part of the brain is, uh, is consciousness. Interestingly, we, we've been reading Mizan al-Amal by Ghazali, in which he reproduces a very long section on the nature of the brain as he understood it, which I think comes from that is the first time I actually realized to what extent, you know, he, uh, because you don't often see that. I haven't seen that before in Yahya, but uh, this is uh, very close to what, you know, Jamal Khalili has been writing about the scientists, you know, he, so it was like he has been reading the scientists, you know, that were, that were, that were writing about in the 19th, 9th and 10th century. But uh, what, the question I wanted to ask, you know, thinking about, uh, bringing it back to the contemporary context, you know, about this very sort of dogged, or at least might might even think about, you know, uh, what Khalid was, what the uh, uh, Khalid Sab was saying that, you know, it's non-imaginative understanding of science by 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 thinking about the atom, you know, exactly which particular, which has its which has had its you know significant success, right, as we know, but on the other hand, I think in modern philosophy, language discourse has actually taken that role. So I wonder if you if you want to comment on you know the role of language as a kind of as, as a continuing open system, which I think also connects with what Shahid was asking, you know, what is what what when science, you know, is as as produces science, but once once it enters the public domain, it takes on, you know, a me, a, 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 it, it is mediatized, it takes on ideological function. So the whole question of language, I think, provides a very good way of thinking about openness. I'm, I'm wondering to what extent it will, it, will, it will support your argument or how it will maybe help us to think forward, to think through. Mm -hmm. Yes, so, uh, thank you. Um, um, so I, I, I think that even science is an imaginative enterprise. I mean, all thinking is imaginative. There's some imagination involved in all kinds of thinking. I mean, poetry, uh, art, uh, even, you know, um, tactile art, all kinds of imaginative work. And I think uh, the imagination is prime, is kind of the primary factor. And when the body is in a particular state, then the imagination can be, can be hampered. Uh, and when it has, you know, uh, a great deal of, uh, when the body is is in a better condition, the imagination also also, uh, you know, flourishes. Um, and, and it's been some time that I've read uh, Mizan al-Amal, but it's also a very inspiring text. 
Yeah, I mean, Ghazali does talk about, you know, from place to place about about the dimag and the and 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 the relationship to the heart and and uh, uh, the, these kinds of questions. Um, so he is familiar with the science of his day or the biology of his day, as 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 we we know it. I mean, and he also learned a lot of these things from the the very same Muslim philosophers that he that he criticized. Um, it's 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 not possible for him not to have known of Ibn Sina's works on medicine and the Qanun and those things that are, you know, very descriptive of how the human body functions and uh, based on his time. So I think the, the question of, of language and, and the Sufis in particular, um, uh, you know, do play with language. There's no one who plays with language better than Ibn Arabi, he takes a word and, and, and an idea and a concept and moves it in so many different directions. It's head spinning stuff. Um, that he does, and and I think uh, in our time, people like Wittgenstein's uh, move in language and language use, and especially Talal Asad, uh, who's kind of also very much uh, taken by Wittgenstein's approach of thinking ab about language and how lang language constitutes reality. Language constitutes reality, right? In other words. And, uh, and there's a big debate, and the debate that I have not fully, uh, you know, wrapped my head around it is this question, you know, is language constitutive or is language representative? Right? Does language represent? Because it's been, there's been a, a huge attack on representation in, in contemporary Western philosophy. That uh, so people like uh, who people who read uh, Wittgenstein, like uh, Cavell, uh, Stanley Cavell, and others, um, raised this question that that we are always already constituted by language. So language is not separated from us, and because people have seen the the idea of representation to be extremely uh, problematic, uh, because the representation then is is the truth and the only truth. And that's how you had domination and domination through knowledge. So it's a question that I'm, I'm struggling with, you know. Uh, I mean, when I, when, I, when I have a street address, it represents that, you know, the place that I need to go. Uh, so there are instances that we are still dependent on representation. Um, but I also understand it also depends, you know, where you where you end up philosophically. Are you a realist or an idealist? Is reality constituted within the body and the mind and, and the soul and through the body? And that's the only way we understand reality. Or are there moments in which we become, you know, realists? Uh, you know, the reality is out there. It has a certain kind of objectivity, but it is mediated through our bodies and so on. And therefore, even an objective reality can be, uh, you know, understood differently. Um, you know, the famous story: Do you know when trees fall in 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 the in the forest? You know, you know, uh, is that you know what what does that mean? You know. Is, is, does it relate to me or not? So I think the, the, these are. So these are the. I, I think the question of uh, the question that you raise about language. Someone, uh, you know. So Ghazali. I have uh, very interesting passages of Ghazali, um, where where he would differ from someone like Ibn Taymiyyah in in language, and because Ibn Taymiyyah always sees language as representation. You know, there are isomorphic relationships with, with words and ideas. Uh, and these words must be, you know, uh, held onto very firmly. Um, someone like Ghazali would say that you first need to uh, to grasp the intention and the mana of a thing, and you, and then you apply the mana, the in, the meaning of the word to the word used. In other words, is open to much more open to metaphorical use. Uh, and language as as metaphor and metaphorical, and he's also landed into trouble himself uh, by using language in, in metaphorical ways, um, um, especially the story when he talked about. Like, I think I, I have it in the book, my book Ghazali and the Poetry of Imagination, where he says that you know in the hadith that says you know angels don't enter a house in which there is a dog, 
And he says, well, that means that angels don't enter a heart in which there is with their animal or canine qualities. Mm -hmm. And he gets attacked for that. And then he has to clarify, say, no, no, I mean, it does have a literal meaning and it is also possible for this meaning. And that was Ghazali's real beef with the Muslim philosophers that they almost explicitly and, you know, and almost absolutely said, no, there's only one meaning of some of these verses in the revelation. And that's the way we understand it. And they were not open to, you know, a, a plurality of understandings because they came and he criticized them, but they came from such a commanding and supremacist position that they understand the reality fully. And therefore, you know, there will not be bodily resurrection. If only they said it could be understood to be bodily resurrection, or it could be understood to be, uh, you know, a, a spiritual resurrection on the day of judgment, Ghazali would not have attacked it. But because they so explicitly said that, the, and that the bodily resurrection is meant for the multitude, the philosopher said, and but those of us who know better, we know it is not. So that that makes Ghazali very furious. So I think one of the things that Ghazali says in one of his uh, Qanun al-Ta'wil, uh, I always do it as a diagram of three elements. He says that um, do not reject reason. Uh, so you put it on a triangle, you put it on, don't reject reason. Secondly, um, uh, show humility, in other words, don't say you know it all. And the third leg, he would say that be open to multiple possibilities, multiple interpretations. That's how I read Qanun al-Tawil. So those kinds of possibilities, you be open. And I think it has to do with language because language can never be, can, can never fully signify itself and it, it continues to signify. I mean, no wonder many Muslim modernists, for instance, read modern science into the Quran because the word opened itself up to certain kind of signification and resignification uh, that they use a word. So for instance, the word kitab, the word kitab in the Quran doesn't mean a book, it means authority, right? I mean, uh, you know, on, uh, or, or it means some kind of, you know, um, place, but most of us think when you say iqra, we think about reading a book you know, recite, you're reading a book. So the imagine the, 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 the contemporary Muslim's imagination is already infiltrated by his or her time and the world around that. But therefore we need tradition uh, to basically give us the archive of, of interpretation to show whether that the past interpreted in that way doesn't necessarily mean that we have to adhere to that, but at least we can, when we can see in the archive what the past was, and then we have good reasons to justify why we're not going to read it in that way today. And we can justify our positions on that. Um, and I think a tradition uh, does kind of uh, make a, a and, and obviously tradition is not singular, it is also diverse. Um, so yeah. depends where on the, on the traditional spectrum you find yourself. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, first of all, uh, Ibrahim, uh, for, for sharing with us with your, you know, with, first of all, with the paper, you know, sending us a, a pre-circulated paper and also then entertaining these questions. I think they've left uh, uh, further developed, I hope that they have give, you know, given you some food of food for further thought for your next paper, but certainly they, it has done that for us. And I'm sure for, you know, just you. by going by the comments on the side, certainly it has been like that. I have uh, so we, uh, I also want to thank everybody else who has joined us, each one of you for coming and, and still staying with us until now. We will continue this conversation with uh, Professor Maria Malatar uh, next, uh, next month. We usually meet the, the last Thursday of every month. And so uh, we'll send you the invitation because we have you, uh, as, you, as you have registered. I hope that you don't mind that we will send you an invitation for the next one as well and hope to see you. Thank, so you. thank you, Brian. It was really good to see you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you all. Yeah. All right. Salam. Salam. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. Good to see everybody.